Welcome. I am Alison Johnston, MSP, the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament and chair of Scotland's Futures Forum. And I would like to welcome you all to this online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with Scotland's Futures Forum. This afternoon's event is about diversity in the political world, and our partner for this event is the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, known as CRER. I am especially pleased that CRER has partnered with us, as we are also part of their Black History Month of events, films, podcasts and workshops. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from our audience as we get into our discussion. The Scottish Parliament elections in May resulted in our most diverse Parliament yet, a very positive development. But today, we are here to drill down and discuss how much progress does this actually signal in a political world that needs to be representative of a Scotland with a 4% minority ethnic population. We should also ask why it took so long. What barriers did our members and panellists here today face? And how do we address this issue of political democracy and diversity? To answer these questions, I am very pleased today to be joined by panellists whom you can read about in more detail on the festival website. But let me introduce Jatin Harrier, the Chief Executive of CRER, Cocab Stewart, who is an MSP for Glasgow Kelvin and Deputy Convener of the Education, Children and Young People Committee, and Foisal Chowdhury. Foisal is an MSP for Lothian and a member of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. There will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter your question or comment into the question and answer box. Make sure to state your first name and where you are from, and we will try to get through as many as we possibly can. But I would like to begin by asking each of our panellists, what is your perception on the state of play with political diversity and representation in Scotland today? I am going to go first to Cocab, then Foisal, and then Jatin. So may I ask Cocab to respond? Thanks, Alison. Um, that's such an important question, and I'm delighted to be uh, part of this event today. Um, it's uh, good to keep this at the top of the agenda. Um, so we have got a bit of a breakthrough. Uh, my worry is that if we take the focus off uh, representation of underrepresented groups, uh, then we might go backwards. In the past, that has happened uh, when it's come to 50-50 uh, sort of like female uh, sort of like representatives in elected uh, democratic structures. So I think that you know, uh, 21 years it's taken me. Um, it was 21 years ago that I was the first woman of colour or the first person of colour to actually stand. Uh, for any kind of parliament, um, that was the first Scottish Parliament elections, of course, but I'm including Westminster there as well. So that is progress, but it has taken far too long. And that probably, you know, as we go on through our discussions today, we'll probably come back to some of the multiple barriers that I have certainly faced, um, and I'm happy to discuss them today, but also uh, my peer groups as well, you know, many women of colour in particular, but also people of colour. Thank you very much, Cocab. Can I put that question to Foisal? Thank you, Alison. Uh, it's an honour for me to be here with you all today. Um, and uh, I really uh, just want to echo what Cocab said just now. It is making progress. Uh, but yes, uh, still some way to go. Uh, but this panel here today could not have been achieved in 2016. And I know from my own community that there is much more encouragement and excitement about having a now a Bangladeshi voice in the parliament. And I can proudly say, and we, we have six, people, six of us in the parliament. And as Kokob say, I think we are uh, making progress, but still a long way to go. 
Thank you very much, Choisel. Can I put that question to Jatin now? Um, what's your perception on the state of play with political diversity and representation in Scotland today? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Festival of Politics for joining us again. It's become a regular event now uh, that you know, we do an event to mark Black History Month. Yeah. So that's just uh, fantastic, and I think every other institution should do something to mark Black History Month as well. In terms of the question, um, I think echoing what, what the previous two people have said, yeah, it's great. You know, it's great we've got six uh, BME representatives. It's great we've got our first two women in part of BME women in Parliament. But there, there's, as, as Kolkab said, it's we've got to keep an eye that it's not just a one-off thing, and, and it's too easy to lose the gains that have been made. Um, I, I think if hope people won't contradict me, maybe they, maybe they will. But Boisel and Pam, I think their election was unexpected by some. You know, in terms of numbers, I'm not talking about them personally. Just uh, and Kolkab would not have got a seat if Sandra White had not been resigning. Uh, so these gains are great, but they're not embedded in the system as yet. Uh, and, and until we embed these things, the, the danger of going backwards is, is so high. You know, all, all six are still of South Asian origin. There's still a way to go about other ethnic, ethnicities being represented in parliament. And at the end of the day, though, it's not, I mean, representation is very important, but for, for us, it's about what anti-racist action will be taken by the parliament. Uh, and the two things don't always go together. In, in the, you know, we did some study of 20 years of devolution and how race had been considered. And there were far more discussion of race in chamber debates in the first two sessions of parliament when there were no BME representatives. So that's something, I mean, I'm not putting all the focus on BME politicians to, to, have, to make that happen. I think it's up to the parties and, and the leadership of the parties. But yeah, it, it's something to watch out for. Obviously, we'll see what happens in the council elections coming up next year. Uh, but we need to embed these gains into the system somehow. Otherwise, there's great danger we'll lose them. Thank you. Thank you all. So I think the message um, th that we're hearing loud and clear is that progress isn't necessarily linear. We can't take it for granted. We can't think that this is necessarily the first step towards the truly representative parliament that we all want to see, and that we have to make sure that there's no slippage from now on, that there is only progress. So. Uh, you know, we've got a chance to explore how we make sure that that happens. Um, and I note what Jatin is saying that there were more debates on the issue of diversity previously. So we mustn't we mustn't assume that because we have a more diverse parliament that we need to stop debating and discussing it. So can I ask what you see as the barriers in encouraging more Scots from minority ethnic backgrounds to enter the world of politics on a community or council or national level? Um, can I put that question first to Foisel, then to Jatin, and then to Kokab? Thank you very much, Alison. Um, I would say racism, cost, networks, and prejudice. I mean, do the institution seem flexible and responsive to change? This is the first time in Scotland that asylum seekers and refugees uh, have been able to vote alongside the rest of the population. And this should be welcomed. And having the vote is a good way of increasing engagement with Scottish Parliament. Uh, it's important that everyone in Scotland sees the Parliament and its MSPs are there for them. I made a promise uh, when I was elected uh, to bring everyone's voice into the Parliament. So I've been visiting projects and arranging to do recording when needed, and welcoming everyone to come along once we are able to fully use the building again. That has to be truly mean everyone. Uh, if you think you are being heard, it's more likely you will engage with politics, and that could go on to people playing a role themselves at every level. So I think it's engaging with people, bringing them into the parliament, and you know, it's, it's just getting them involved and uh, make them feel that they're here and they're part of us. Thank you. Can I put that question to Jatin? Question of barriers. Yeah, I, I would turn that around because uh, I think 
parties themselves need to make changes. I don't think there's a lack of interest from uh, minority ethnic people. Uh, the, the only data we have, there's a lack of data about uh, involvement in politics by ethnicity generally. But for the, for the Scottish parliamentary elections, the SNP was the most open about who it is. I think there were 21 candidates of minority ethnic origin standing for SNP seats. So there didn't seem to be any lack of interest or ability because they all went through the wetting system. Uh, so I think, and you know, last at, at the last council elections, if I'm right, there was like dozens of BME candidates standing as independents. Now that's the most difficult thing to do to stand. I think as uh, Faisal mentioned, cost, etc. But they obviously they found the parties were either not for them or not willing to work with them. So they had to go down the independent route. Now that's not a way to get elected. I think we all know that in the main but i don't think there's a lack of interest out there i think i think there's a there are barriers within parties um and you know and folks will mention racism some of the candidates who stood in the last election mentioned racism not just from people voters but from their own party members and activists so i would turn that around and say the parties need to face up to these challenges Thank you. Thank you very much Jatin. Um, Cocab, I'd like to, to hear your views on what the barriers are. Um, thanks, Alison. Um, the barriers um, have been multiple and quite uh, profound, um, and I don't think I've ever been allowed to forget uh, that I am a woman of colour. Um, and I do sometimes because I see myself as a person who's interested in education, that's interested in housing. Um, however, you know, uh, people's stereotypes and perceptions of me um, give me a barrier straight away before I've even spoken. Uh, race inevitably um, has been, and as a woman of Pakistani origin, uh, there's also been cultural barriers there from within my own communities who have found it more acceptable for males to take part in frontline politics and for women to do the background community uh, stuff and supporting quietly rather than actually taking uh, the platform. Um, gender has inevitably had something to do with it, um, and in the past, what I've found is that uh, you know people have said, "Oh, Kokab, you know, um, I can't believe that you know you haven't been successful because you know you're a woman, you're a woman of colour, uh, you know all these things." But the reality is, is that the women seem to think that uh, sort of like people from within your own communities will be supporting you and encouraging you and bring you on. Um, that doesn't happen because you're a female, um, and within the, your own communities, people uh, overlook you because uh, they think that because you're a female, then the female networks will be supporting you, and then that doesn't happen. So you fall through the cracks in that sense. Uh, there's also a class issue as well, and having access, as Foisel mentioned, having access to networks and uh, certain groups. Uh, you know, there may be social occasions that I don't attend um, because of cultural situations, so therefore you're excluded from the networks that are already established. When it comes to, I, I hear what Jatin is saying um, about uh, the onus being on political parties. Um, the pol political parties are made up of people from society. So I would say that it is actually incumbent on everybody uh, to be actually checking one, possibly their own privilege, and also checking in their own biases and uh, their own stereotypical views. Uh, it's an interesting one with racism. We absolutely know exists. We know it exists, and yet um, it is actually very difficult to accuse somebody of it or to call it out. We all say you should call it, out, you know, call out racism, whether policies, uh, procedures, rules that are set by uh, political parties or any other body, actually, any other selection body. It's the same in recruitment processes and jobs as well, where uh, ethnic minorities are also underrepresented in many spheres, including in teaching, especially when it comes to promoted posts. Um, and people, you know, the rules are, have not been created uh, with input from people with, from underrepresented groups. And that's what I found is that, you know, as soon as I sort of jump through one barrier, one hurdle, another one appears and another one appears. And the rules of engagement constantly change. 
And I have to say, it's absolutely exhausting to, to navigate that kind of sort of, uh, you know, landscape that you have in front of you. Um, but I am very optimistic. I will sort of, you know, close uh, my comments here on an optimistic note, is that people like myself and Faisal, who have been champions of anti-racism, and we have campaigned quite sort of visibly on it, uh, so I hope that addresses a wee bit of what Jatin was saying, is that it's not enough to be here. You actually have to be visibly anti-racist and visibly promoting diversity and making sure that, uh, you know, now that the door is opened, that that door remains open uh, for the next generation coming through. Thank you, Kokab. I'm going to put the next question to Jatin and then to Foisal and then back to Kokab. And it is... How important are shortlists, quotas, and selection committees when it comes to political diversity? Uh, extremely important, because they, you know, in, in a number of seats, whoever the candidate is for a particular party, if that party is in the majority, will you know they'll win. So, the the choosing of candidates is is even more important than anything else, almost. So, and that's what I said, you know, last time around, and, and I don't want to pick on the SNP, but that's the only party we have any good data for. There were 21 candidates standing, so they, they passed all that internal vetting. Uh, but then it's also about if they're standing on a list, where, where they are on the list, because, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of people were lower down the list with no chance of winning, really. Um, the, the law is still unclear about whether we can have all black shortlists and things. And, you know, I have to praise the SNP for taking that action of promoting some of their minority candidates top of lists. Unfortunately, not the winnable uh, lists, not the winnable regions. Um, but it goes back to we, we need parties to have a much more diverse membership to start with. As Kokab is saying, this, these are made up of individual people, you know, of the general public. But we have no data about party membership and ethnicity. So until we get a fair representation in membership, it's going to be hard to get fair representation in selected people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more work to be done to make sure political parties represent the people of Scotland. Uh, but and, and then everything sort of flows from there. We need to make sure that there's the active there's fair representative of activists, fair representative of councillors, and then fair representative of F MSPs. Uh, talk about backroom staff, which are also very really important in parties. Do we have any data about ethnicity, ethnic origin of party staff? I don't think we have any. Um, so there's a lot of work. Again, I'm going to put it down to parties that they've got to do a lot of this work. And at the moment, it doesn't look like they're really doing as much as they need to do. Thank you. Can I ask Foisal that question? How important do you believe that selection committees, quotas and shortlists are when it comes to achieving political diversity? Very, very important. Um, I, th I think, I mean, if, if you look at what Labour Party has done uh, with uh, Omens 50-50, uh, I mean, there, if there is a quota for uh, others as well, then I think we'll achieve that. But uh, it's, I, I think if you look at the membership list, uh, you will find very few ethnic minority people uh, joining the parties. I'm not sure about the other parties, but I've seen uh, during my uh, election procedures, I've seen the membership list and I know the percentage of our the minority people. The, I think the other thing is, I, I, I'm not sure why uh, we're not reaching out to them. Uh, when I was talking to people uh, from ethnic minority background, uh, what their voice was that when it comes to uh, decision making, there is hardly anybody, and I think Coca touched on that. When you go into uh, people selecting candidates or making decisions, there is hardly anybody from ethnic minority background. So I think there's, as I said at the beginning, the more more work has to be done, and we, everyone, and uh, what Jatin said, all parties need to look into their policies, and uh, we have to find a way. And where we are, I don't think it's good enough. We have to have a quota system, and if that is in place, you'll, you'll get more ethnic minority people. And as I said at the beginning, since I was elected, uh, there's a lot more people from Bangladeshi community has joined the party. And I think that's the way forward. Uh, we all who are elected, 
have to talk to people, meet with people, and bring them into the parliament and tell them what MSPs, MPs, and councillors do. And I can see a big interest uh, in the council election. Not sure how many will get selected, but uh, time will tell. Thank you. Thank you, Foisal. So from, from our conversation there, I'm picking up on the need for an intersectional approach. Um, let's not just simply focus on race or gender or class, but let's tackle all of these issues and clearly support from our panellists for, well, just for, you know, affirmative action for quotas, perhaps, for a really, you know, for an embedding of action that means it's not a lottery, that it's not accidental, that we really do everything that we can to promote diversity. I have a question from our audience. This is from Mustak in Leicester. And the question is, hi all, should Afro-Scottish history be added to, to the curriculum in schools? And I'm going to go to COCAB and then Foisal and then Jatin. Thank you, Alison. Um, to answer uh, that particular question, um, I think that decolonisation of the curriculum um, has already started uh, to a certain extent, and I do applaud uh, the various uh, council local authorities across Scotland um, that have already uh, taken that on, but we have much, much further to go on that. Um, I, I've been a teacher for about 30 years, and at that time, you know, during that time, I've had to actively sort of like seek out uh, alternative histories. Uh, for instance, when we've been teaching the war, um, and well, when I say the war. Uh, Sometimes we do the First World War, the Second World War. I'm encompassing that. However, the role of uh, people from uh, South Asia, for instance, um, you know, the contribution of uh, Indians and Pakistanis, Afro Caribbeans um, during that time is totally overlooked. Um, so I think that from a broader level, I absolutely agree that we need to decolonise uh, the curriculum so that we get a more accurate history that is actually more relevant to our youngsters and they can see their heritage and the essential role that they uh, have played and their heritage has played in the advancement of uh, the world, really, um, in that way. Because uh, I can tell you, you know, children do feel quite invisible, and um, the reality is that a certain uh, percentage of your class do switch off. And when they question it, I often find that pr as practitioners, we're not all as confident um, to look beyond uh, just the narrow uh, curriculum that is put in front of you. Uh, but I, I am delighted to say that there's been, you know, huge improvements, um, and there's loads of resources now that are available that people are tapping into. Thank you, Kokab. Can I put that question to Foisal? So much, uh, Alison. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, black history needs to be part of the curriculum. Uh, history should be, uh, you know, uh, told. Fully, and children uh, need to be taught. I mean, uh, in my previous role as a chair of uh, Edinburgh and Lothian Regional Equality Council, I've worked uh, very closely with quite a lot of schools and uh, listening to the students uh, from ethnic minor minority background. Uh, the stories I've heard were very, very painful, and quite a lot of people uh, were doing stuff, but they were not aware of that they are hurting other people by doing this. For example, uh, if you go to uh, a Muslim girl and pull her hijab and say, oh, what's under your uh, your scarf? That's, you know, people, and or if you go to an African person and say, uh, touch is here and say, or her here and say, is that how you're born? So there is uh, a lot, things we have to teach our children from the very young age. And I totally agree that that has got to be part of the curriculum. Wales has done that. Uh, why can't we? Uh, we should, uh, you know, we should learn from each other. And uh, I think if Wales can do it, we can do it as well in Scotland. Thanks, Foisal. Can I put that question to Jatin, the, the influence of what we learn in schools on acceptance and you know boosting diversity in all our public bodies 
Yeah, I agree with the previous two speakers. Uh, it's not about acceptance. Uh, I'm going to use another phrase, which I also don't like using. It's about normalizing uh, black people, uh, you know, looking at the black presence in Scotland, but also Scotland's role in the world, especially in empire and colonialism. And at the end of the day, it's all about challenging racism. That's why we that's why we'd have black history month and then, you know, hopefully work across the whole year, not just in one month. That's why we're campaigning for a national museum of slavery, empire, colonialism and migration. Uh, it, it, it is to tackle racism. And, you know, I think as we've all been saying, that is at the root of everything we're trying to do. And if we can solve that, and I'm not saying we will solve it in the short or medium term, but then we would have more equal representation and we would have better policies uh, that impact on all people. So yeah, it's something, I hear what Kokab is saying, it's back to the steps are being made, absolutely. We need to make sure the momentum continues uh, and it's going to be a long, hard process. It's not something we can do overnight. Uh, it'll need resourcing. I think that's where government can come in and resource it better. Uh, as Foisal said, other places are looking at it as well, so we can learn from them. Uh, but it is, it's hopefully, again, like we said at the very beginning, hopefully it'll not, it's not just flavor of the month for the time being, because it's so high on the agenda just now, and other things will come in as they always do. So it's the job of everybody to make sure it stays high on the agenda. Thank you, Jatin. And you, you are quite right. It's not about, I, I think, um, you know, when we're thinking of acceptance, we've become wholly accepting of having parliaments and public bodies and institutions that aren't properly representative. We've got to move away from that. We've got to challenge it constantly. And we do need to make sure it's absolutely normal that all, all our public bodies and our parliament, which has a, a real role to play here in leadership, is an exemplar of what we want to see. So we've got to make sure that we're taking every step to achieve that. Can I ask, with regards to steps that we might take, how important you feel that initiatives such as CRER's work on the political shadowing scheme and the John Smith Centre at Glasgow University on Leadership and Development Project. How important are these projects in encouraging and mentoring Black, Asian and other minority ethnic Scots to step into public service? Um, I'll, I'll put that question back to Jatin in the first instance, and then I'll go to, to Co-Cab and Foisel. OK. Um... Yeah, we've been running, before lockdown, we were running a political shadowing scheme, uh, mainly for young BME people to pair up with politicians uh, and things. We, we saw that as a two-way process. A, it, it was for the young, for the BME people, uh, part, partly to get access to networks, as has been mentioned before, you know, it's to be normalised in, in the political system, in parliament, um, et cetera, et cetera. But also, we thought it would be of benefit to the politicians themselves to learn from the black people that are shadowing them. Uh, you know, it, I don't know, it may be a lot of politicians don't come across very many uh, BME people in that setting on a day-to-day you know, -day basis. As I say, I think the, the staffing of politicians and parliament and uh, all, all the party staff, uh, uh, that probably needs further work as well. So it's important, but I go back to what I said, I mean, I don't want to put all the onus on uh, BME people, it, it is for the politicians and the parties. Um, so it would have been great if they'd created the scheme instead of us having to create it, but, you know, when there was a lack of the BME representation in the early, you know, a total zero representation in the first two parliaments. Why did nobody think of doing that? Um, we, we set up the cross-party group on racial equality uh, over 10 years ago, but that was on the basis of there was something on golf and fishing, but nothing on race. So again, why did none of the politicians think we better do something? So it is unfortunately, and you know, especially repeating ourselves, these things are cyclical. You know, flavor of the month just now. There's a lot of attention to it. It's so easy for it to disappear, and and that's the big worry. Thank you, Jatin. Can I put that question to Cocap? Thanks, Alison. Um, that's a really, really interesting question for me. Um, I'll draw you a wee parallel through sort of like my journey through education. Um, so during that, I think that I looked back and I undertook, I think it was about four courses in leadership and management, and yet I was unsuccessful 
in gaining a promoted post within education. And that, at the time, I, you know, obviously you think, oh, well, there's something wrong with me. I'm not doing this right. So that, you know, you would do another course and try and correct that. Um, and I went from, uh, you know, not having enough experience to then being told that I actually had too much experience and I may come across as being a bit intimidating. And I thought, how interesting that I never actually hit that sweet spot in the middle where I had just had the right experience and I was the right match there. Um, so uh, it takes me back to the goalposts, you know, uh, are changing. Um, I think leading by example is very important. Um, I have uh, signed up to uh, take interns, paid interns uh, from underrepresented groups myself. Uh, so I do think there is a role in it. But more importantly, what I would like to see is tracking of uh, the uh, people that go through that process. I would like to see tracking and monitoring of their progress. So if they go through the course and that's it, then it's job done. It makes everyone feel better. Yes, we played our part. But actually, what's the impact of that? There has to be more robust impact assessments, tracking and monitoring. Where do these young people or actually, you know, uh, people from any age group, um, you know, it's taken me 21 years, so it's not just for the young. Um, but you know, what do they then go on to achieve? And if they don't get the posts that they wanted or to get into elected positions that they were after uh, or secure that job, then what was it that put them off? And I don't think that there's enough focus on the tracking and monitoring. So that definitely needs to happen more. Yeah, I think um, panel making very strong case this morning for the need for, for data. For a real understanding of, of what is happening, um, I think that's certainly something that we can and need to be doing. Can I ask you, Foisel, your views on the importance of schemes such as CRER's work on the political shadowing scheme, for example? I think it's, I, I, I think this is what needs to be done. I mean, uh, since I was elected, uh, I'm, I'm going to go in a bit different line than what Jatin and Koko have said, because I don't want to repeat what they've said. I totally agree with what they're saying. But uh, since I've been elected, uh, I, I've been getting quite a lot of emails from ethnic minority people who wants to uh, go into the parliament and see the work we do, like uh, to get some work experience. And I think that's the way forward. If if the door is open, I mean, at the moment, they're uh, they're really happy to see that six of us is there, and they feel that they can get access to us. I don't know how many uh, MSPs or MPs or councillors shadowed an ethnic minority uh, student uh, because until you take them in. I mean, uh, recently I ha uh, I've, I've had quite a lot of meetings with uh, groups uh, from business uh, community, and uh, whenever I ask that why ethnic minority people are not encouraging their uh, children to go into politics. And the answer is the, uh, the access was blocked to them. And they felt that they, they were only going to be taken in where the, uh, just to fill up the numbers or take the boxes. So if, for example, um, a couple of them said that they tried uh, to get their kids to join an MP or an MSP uh, for their work experience, which they didn't manage to get. So uh, since I've been elected, I've had a lot of emails that people want to come uh, come into the parliament. And of course, my reply was, once we are open, I will open the door for them. And uh, I've done it uh, as my role in LREC. Uh, and I thought, it's working over there, and I'm sure uh, all, of, all of my colleagues uh, will take if anybody uh, applies to be part of them for a week or work experience. And I think that's the way forward. Thank you, thank you. I mean, it's absolutely you know we we cannot leave. I, I know that your election will be a huge inspiration to many people, but we simply cannot leave it to you to do this work on your own. I think each and every member of this parliament. Um, and beyond has a part to play here. I have a, a comment from, from Leanne, and it's, this is Leanne's comment. Racism is something my children live with on a daily basis. 
the education system definitely needs to be teaching children about the many cultures our country has. Some are quite ignorant about racism and do not realise they are being racist. A lot more of today's racism has come from the generations before. By that, I mean the microaggressions that are stereotypically used towards people of colour. I just, you know, I'd be very grateful to hear our, our panel's comments on on Leanne's, you know, Leanne's contribution, which is an important one. So, can I put that first to Kokab and then to Foisel and then to Jatin? Um, thanks, Leanne. Um, what you have said resonates with me completely, um, and I have children who are of mixed race, and uh, some of the comments that have been uh, made to them. Um, I have had to sort of like make sure that they are resilient to that, um, but also even as a teacher going into schools to challenge that, I find that difficult. Um, as a relatively empowered parent um, over the years, I find that tricky. Um, it is a generational thing. However, we cannot continue to use that as an excuse. Um, there are so many resources out there. Um, there are so many campaigns out there uh, that you would have to be trying particularly hard um, to ignore the education that is available to the whole of society uh, to check our attitudes. I think that people double down um, when you try to sort of like uh, address um, transgressions and microtransgressions, which uh, somebody said, you know, it's like tiny little cuts that sort of like happen uh, to your self-esteem, to your confidence, to your personality, um, that add up and add up. And, uh, you know, there's sort of like many traumas that sort of like constantly undermine you. Um, and you have to navigate that. So the robustness that is required is quite astronomical, I have to say, um, in that sense. And that, you know, is not fair, uh, you know, among, amongst other things. So I absolutely um, hear what Leanne's saying. Um, I mean, I'm certainly doing my best to try and sort of like. Uh, challenge things in a calm, in a rational manner. And the first port of call for me always is that when people demonstrate racist behaviours or attitudes is to offer education so that you know uh, they can um, sort of like change their views. Because that, you know, we're all here for that. We're, we're politicians. We try to persuade people um, towards better things. And as an educationalist, um, I've always tried to educate people as well. Um, so the journey continues. Thank you very much, Kokab. I think um, it, it, you know the fact that it's taken you 21 years to get this far is well. It's testament to your robustness and resilience, but it's also wholly unacceptable that you know we expect at such levels of robustness and resilience. This should not. Yeah. I'm just um, I'm very grateful that you're with us on the panel today, and thank you for your response to Leanne's contribution. Can I ask you to address Leanne's remarks, Foisel? Thank you very much, Alison. Um, I totally agree uh, with Leanne here because uh, I, I think I did mention on my previous comment that uh, it's it's very important that we teach children about racism and uh, sometimes unintentionally they, do, they don't know if they're making racist remark uh, that is uh, something uh, they have to be taught from very young age uh, sometimes they, they they say things they're hurting others uh, which they don't realize uh, it's like uh, to me that everyone should respect everyone doesn't matter what color they are, what religion they are. Uh, I mean, I, I remember uh, talking to an Indian person, uh, Hindu person, very long time ago, and I said, "What would you feel?" He said, "Well, if someone, if I'm in the hospital and a nurse comes to me and says to me, uh, i 'I've got beef,' she'll be offended because." You, 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 there, there should be a, a Hindus don't eat beef, or if you go to Muslim and say I've got pork. So there's lot, a lot of things need to be learned. And there is another thing, uh, if you if you look at every football team or a, a, any sports, you'll find ethnic minority people. As soon as they make a mistake, you know people go on their color. Oh, uh, but they forget that they are the people who took them there. I mean, if you, uh, uh, I'm just going back to the last uh, tennis. 
these two uh, f the two females who were representing uh, UK and Canada. But on on the Twitter, you see that oh, uh, ethnic minorities are taking over. Uh, uh, the two black women are representing uh, our nation. So when as soon as you see these sort of things, it automatically it hurts you. So I I, I, I think uh, if we go on from I mean I I was looking at one of the one of the big uh, in school, it's a story book. They're talking about uh, uh, sugar, uh, sugar cane, and all the stuff. So the, the first page you go into that book is uh, uh, a white man standing and a, and a black man with his hand like that, holding head down. Next page you go into is like he, the the, uh, the the white person is sitting in a chair, the black person is bringing them the coffee. So it, when you see these sort of things. What is children going to learn from those books and those pictures? So all these things need to be looked at. And, uh, and Lian, I I totally agree with you uh, what you're saying. There's a lot more need to be done, and children need to be taught from very young age. Jatin, could I ask you to please respond to, to Lian's contribution? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, Lian's 100% right, uh, but. I wouldn't want to pass this racism off as a generational thing. Uh, you know, we see the number of racial incidents in Scottish schools. It, it's appalling, uh, absolutely appalling. And you know, we've seen a lot of attention to Edinburgh schools recently, and you know, independent reports and other stuff. So, uh, but that is, uh, applies across the piece across Scotland. Um, so, the question is, what what can we do about it? Um, and it isn't just what we can do in schools, because uh, children get their um, attitudes, et cetera, from lots of other places as well as schools, from their parents, from society, from television. So that's why it needs to be tackled across the piece. You know, we might, if we only stick to schools, we might be wasting a lot of their time and effort, because then they learn something at school and they learn something different when they go home. That's why it really needs a much more comprehensive response. I'm not saying I've got all the answers. Uh, but we need to normalize uh, black people's presence. Uh, you know, why are there so few black people in jobs in the public sector in Scotland? It's not a no it's not normal to see a black person in a public sector job. Uh, and until that changes, people will always see us as different, uh, and that perpetuates racism. Uh, so there's work to be, you know. And back to what we were saying earlier about mentoring and all that. Well, black people get much better qualification in the in the main black minority people get better qualifications at school than their white counterparts but it doesn't lead to, to jobs or even you know certainly doesn't lead to better jobs but often it doesn't lead to jobs at all so what's going on um and until we tackle all these things uh you know we've got so few bme teachers uh less than two percent of teachers are of bme origin in scotland whereas the population is it should be more like six percent maybe uh uh, and so it's, again, it's not normal to see a, a teacher of any origin in the classroom. That just makes it something that is isn't not a normal situation, and that's the sort of things we need to tackle. Yes, attention in schools, absolutely. Um, decolonizing the curriculum, absolutely. But we can't look at these things piecemeal. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jatin. I've got a question from Susan in Edinburgh. Obviously, the Festival of Politics has been uh, running since since Wednesday, and Susan, who's obviously tuned into an earlier session, is saying during the violence against women session on Thursday, the issue of abuse on social media came up. I think Foisel sort of referred to that in his his last response. There, what are the panelists' views on whether this kind of discourse puts people off coming into public life? So I'm going to go to Foisel and then to Jatin and then to Coca. I think I'm a victim of that as well. Social media. I think uh, it is totally unacceptable, and uh, there is got to be more scrutiny need to be done. And uh, I just recently uh, someone ha uh, created a fake uh, account uh, with my name and uh, my pictures, etc. Uh, and when I reported that to the uh, Facebook, uh, I. W I got a reply back saying that uh, it, it falls in our, uh, you know, so we're not going to remove that. And then I, I replied again and I said, a person who put a picture of me and uh, a photograph of mine uh, in there, 
and you're saying it's okay. But I think uh, it's totally out of order when uh, people go on and start putting in, uh, the, 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 I think the government need to look into this and uh, there's got to be uh, uh, a guideline to all the social media providers uh, that the you know whoever opens an account sometimes quite a lot of accounts people create uh, you don't even know who they are and nowadays you see uh, facebook tiktok instagram uh, and so and so that uh, and it's it's like people hiding behind and every time you go in social media you'll find uh, somebody is attacking someone and it's totally, totally unfair. And it does put people off because you, you probably had a long day, hard day. You've done a lot of work. And I'm sure uh, uh, Jatin and Kuka will agree with me and even yourself that if it's, it's very easy to hurt someone just to make a, a you know, a stupid comment. And I, 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 I think that is not acceptable at all. Nobody, uh, you know, n nobody should face this sort of things. And as I did say that uh, during the football time uh, when England lost, you've seen uh, how badly social media uh, attacked the black players. And same thing goes uh, for uh, all of us. And I, I don't think uh, none of us deserve bad uh, comments for no reason on social media. Thank you, Foisal. I'd be interested to hear Jatin's comments on social media and how it can put people off engaging. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have much more to add to what Foisal said. I mean, obviously, it would put some people off, uh, but we can't let that be used as an excuse not to take action on other things. You know, we've, we've seen, uh, I think Hamza Yusuf is probably the highest profile in terms of negative, so, you know, not negative, but abusive social media uh, aimed at him. But, uh, and, you know, Code Cab are, are relatively new, and I'm sure they're going to suffer their, their share of that. It, it, it's, a, it's a wider problem than, than just this. And, yeah, Foysal's uh, right, social media companies, um, I'm not sure what the answers are necessarily, but, um, you know, again, it, people use it not just on race grounds, but on, on gender, obviously. Uh, so, Diane Abbott, you know, for example, has faced the most horrendous uh, abuse on social media. Um, you know, in the last week, we've, we've uh, once again had this, you know, should politics be a much more nicer arena? Uh, but again, these things are cyclical. We've had it before, but, you know, we had it with Joe Cox, we've had it again. Now, uh, things will slip again, we'll get, you know, we'll come back to it again. Something long term, something strategic, something meaningful. Uh, about all these things, I say we shouldn't look at one thing on its own because it, it, it's all part of the same problem at the end of the day. Thank you. Can I put that question to to Kokab? It was it's Susan who is asking, you know, for views on whether the kind of discourse, some of the discourse we see on social media, puts people off coming into public life. Thanks, Susan, uh, for that question. Um, I think that, generally speaking, I think that politics needs to be a kinder, a more respectful place. Um, I totally get uh, that it's party political, and uh, but I also um, fully recognise that it is not beyond us. You know, we're all sort of articulate, very passionate people that can put our views across in a respectful and a robust manner without being offensive or abusive uh, or aggressive um, in any way. Um, I think that, you know, uh, that is a lesson in leadership and we are all in positions of leadership. You know, children are watching us, society is watching us. So the Scottish Parliament um, has a role to play in how we conduct ourselves um, and we should be doing that very professionally and uh, respectfully. I think that the abuse has always been there, um, you know, because I've got such a, a long history in campaigning. Um, it was quite overt, you know, on the street. Um, I've been called names. I've had my leaflets ripped up. Um, I've even had uh, people say, don't put your photograph on a leaflet because people will be able to tell uh, that you're a different colour and they won't vote for you. Um, at polling stations, I've had, uh, you know, people saying, now, remember and vote for the candidate who was born in this country. 
So, I mean, I actually wasn't, but they are making an assumption that I wasn't. Um, many of my generation um, and minorities were born here. Um, so that can happen, overt name calling. It didn't take, I think it took about a week before I got my first um, quite overtly offensive letter, uh, which was handwritten. Um, a lot of effort went into that. Um, and was delivered. Uh, and the sad thing is, that it was actually my staff that read it, who were quite traumatised by reading such offensive content. Um, and it was directly challenging my right to be uh, an elected representative, that a person like me, um, of colour, uh, should not be elected and did not speak for the people of Scotland. Um, and and it was, you know, I won't go into the other <laughs> sort of like uh, more offensive content that was in there. Social media, I think, amplifies it. The the danger of social media is that it encourages pylons. Um, it spreads rapidly. So people tweet, they retweet uh, on Facebook. Uh, you know, people can put their comments in, they can share. So absolutely, there is a role for uh, regulatory bodies. Um, definitely, I think there should be more regulation and responsibility taken uh, by those platforms. But ultimately, it is also about our own behaviours. Um, you know, uh, people say all sorts of things on social media. Would they say those things to a live person in front of them? And it's that kind of self-discipline and self-filtering that social media seems to sort of like, you know, it goes out the window. And I think that that's a real shame um, because actually I think social media has a very important role to play and uh, can be a great force for good as well. Uh, so it is again about education, about challenging your own assumptions, thinking before you make that offensive tweet, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and is that the best way to achieve it? You know, so it's questioning yourselves. Um, and does it put people off? Absolutely, it does. Uh, if you come from an already marginalised group, if you're already underrepresented, um, if you're already invisible and silenced and not listened to, um, absolutely, that is going to put you off uh, doing that. But then it's up to all of us, I think, to make sure that um, we build people's confidence and unfortunately, you know, uh, take advantage of the, the training courses that are there for us as parliamentarians to help us cope with uh, online abuse. Um, but certainly, I think that, you know, with people uh, being at home a lot more during the COVID uh, crisis, well, we're still in it. Um, a lot of people took to social media and ended up in echo chambers, and you know it has become quite toxic. I have to say, um, a measured, sensible use of it and switching it off regularly, I think, helps keep you sane. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question from Daniel, and Daniel is asking. How are our vibrant black and minority ethnic communities contributing to discussions on the big social issues of the day, such as assisted dying, for example? Can I put that to Jatin and then to Foisel and then to Coca? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would assume the very variety of views on assisted dying, for example, is Similar in BME communities as it is in white communities. I don't, I don't think there's a racial angle that I can obviously see to it. Uh, so I think it'll be a reflection of wider society. Uh, but that applies to a whole host of social issues. You know, it's really good to see we've got um, BME representatives from a variety of political parties in Parliament. You know, it's not just one party or two. You know, parties on the left, for example. So. You know, BME communities are as varied as anybody else, um, and, and that's how it sh should be. Thank you very much. Um, over to Foisel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on, Foisel. Uh, thank you very much, Alison. I was hoping you're going to put Cook up before me on that one, but uh, I do. Uh, obviously, I do have uh, uh, 
conflict of interest in here because if if I talk it, I'm, I'm a Muslim person, and if if I bring in my religious aspect to that, and uh, what Jatin said, if it's you know if it becomes a community issue, uh, then uh, my answer will be different than what. Uh, presentation I'm hearing but then again this is one chapter I really uh, didn't want to get involved and being a new MSP uh, sometimes I find it very difficult when it comes to um, of course uh, we are part of that I am I, I'm willing to listen to people but when it comes to uh, religious aspect of that is that uh, to me, if I ask that to my dad or my imam, or if I go to Hindu Mandir and I speak to anybody, uh, I think all will give me the answer that that uh, death is in not in the hands of yourself. You know. So to me, uh, this is something very, and I, I'm, I, I, I'm 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 looking at it very cl closely. I'm listening it very closely, and um, I think it's should be uh, more talked about, motivated, and uh, as I said, I do have conflict of interest in here uh, with my religious hat on. Yeah, no, th thank you very much, Faisal. I mean, these are complex issues, and Parliament will have an opportunity, I'm sure, to discuss them in due course. Um, so I'll put that question to CoCab too. I think it's a question just about yeah, how um, yeah. You know, these issues of public debate are, are, are debated more generally, how they're discussed. Yeah, Alison, I agree with that. Um, uh, sort of, uh, it's important to recognise that BAME communities, I alluded to it earlier, um, is that yes, we're interested in uh, racism because we have to be. Um, but believe you me, um, I would rather not be talking about racism and not be talking about equalities issues all the time. Um, and I know that BAME communities are just as opinionated on all the social issues of the day. And certainly in my constituency, housing is a big issue. Transport is a big issue. Business, local businesses um, and their experiences are uh, enormous issues. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, in the usual way of um, community activism, um, I think that in my experience, it usually starts with uh, discussions within a safe space. So that tends to be local community groups where people get together and share their views, um, also using um, online platforms and chat rooms and social media to discuss those um, and I certainly make every effort to make sure that elected representatives um, at all levels, um, council, MSP and MPs, uh, reach out to those communities to hear their views, uh, rather than making assumptions about what those views are, but actually to listen meaningfully and to engage in that debate. Um, and the other thing that I try to do is uh, also, I know that the Scottish Parliament has various consultations that take place. The Scottish Government um, undertakes uh, public um, consultations. So to try and point, you know, you, you signpost people to make sure that they are taking part by uh, clicking on the website or, you know, getting in touch with the relevant people and making sure that their views are there. Um, but of course, we will only do that uh, by making sure that the Scottish Parliament uh, is relevant to all of our communities. And one way we can do that is by looking like them and sounding like them and making sure that we're open and accessible. So then that encourages all communities to actually engage in uh, discussing the big social issues of the day. Thank you very much indeed. I'm aware that we're getting close to, to the end of our time, but I'm going to probably push on and try and squeeze in a little uh, couple of more questions. Can I ask about the impact of Black Lives Matters? How, how important was the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on the Scottish Parliament election in May this year for political parties, candidates and the voting public? Um, I appreciate that, that Jatan's made the point, I think, quite quite clearly that this this may feel a bit like uh, you know a debate that's flavor of the month at the moment but we need systemic change and we cannot simply you know let the attention that's focused on this issue die down but i'm just wondering you know i'd like to to understand what your views are on the impact of black lives matter campaign at this point in time can i put that question first to foisel and then to cocab and then to jatin uh, thank you very much alison uh, 
a definite wake up call for some people. Um, basically, the BLM movement encouraged voters to vote more for diversity. Uh, it became a political movement. Uh, I joined uh, the protest outside the parliament. Uh, one of my first speech as an MSP, uh, 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 demanding uh, no more George Floyd. Uh, the, the the internet and worldwide communication has its problem, um, but uh, in this instance, uh, we are quickly able to see demonstration in Australia uh, have conversation with. Uh, activists across the globe. So I, I think it is a very wake up call and uh, uh, got people out to vote. And uh, that's about it. Wake up call to everyone. Thank you very much. Can I put that to Cool Cab? Alison, um, yeah, I, I think that it was um, significant, but probably not as much as we would like it to have been. Um, I think at that time, obviously, you know, uh, when tragic events happen, and sadly they happen too often, and they do actually happen regularly. Um, so, you know, people came together, um, and I remember uh, an online event where uh, black people were able to come along, express their views and opinions um, in the context of, like, you know, dreadful racism in, in every area. Um, elected members came along to that and listened to it. Now, I do believe that there were a few parliamentary questions that were put down, um, and there was a discussion about it. Um, at that time, uh, we only had two uh, you know, ethnic minority members uh, in the parliament that were there, but I take the point that it's incumbent on everyone uh, to be discussing it. Um, from that, have I seen any lasting legacies? I'm not sure that I have. Um, I'm constantly having to refer back to it. Um, so I do get what Jatin's saying about the flavour of the month. Um, it, it cannot be that. But what I do think has happened is that the momentum for change, I think, has become irreversible. I think we are definitely moving forward. Uh, the younger generation, younger people, certainly in my experience, um, students in particular, um, they became very much more confident in challenging racism and calling it out, having the discussions with their parents, having the discussions uh, with, their, you know, with their peers as well. And that is fantastic. That is sort of like, you know, uh, everybody doing the job, because we should all be doing the job. It cannot be less left to a few of us. Um, and to see people not being afraid of uh, being challenged back or getting that resistance back, they were prepared to take that on. And I think that was a great thing, that now we do have a generation of uh, people whose expectations are high, and so they should be. Thank you. Um, Jatin, can I ask you about your views on the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, I think for us, it, it was Black Lives Matter and also COVID almost coming together. Uh, and COVID showed the big discrepancies uh, that were applying to Black minority ethnic communities as a health policy, social policy, etc. And, and the, the two things are very much linked together. Uh, you know, a lot of the COVID impacts were uh, as a result of social deprivation, which impacts far greater on black minority ethnic communities. So I think it, it, the combination of the two things almost at the same time is what led to, to uh, you know, as Kokab says, moment, you know, momentum for change. Uh, but having uh, and so there's a much greater, I, I don't use that word, understanding, uh, acknowledgement of institutional racism out there just now. Uh, I think. Yeah, I deliberately didn't want to use the word understanding because I'm not sure that there's a greater understanding as yet. But obviously, first you start with acknowledgement, then you lead to understanding. So that's where we need to get to. Having said that, I spoke earlier about racial attacks in schools or racial incidents in schools. I'm not sure. I haven't seen the data, the most recent data, but I'm not sure it's declined. And that would be one of the successes of Black Lives Matter if we stopped or, or you know, to really decrease the number of racial incidents in schools. I, I don't think we're there yet by any means. So I hope COCAB is right in terms of momentum for change, but only time will tell. 
Thank you, thank you, Jatin. Now we are we are over time, but I'm going to put one more. You know, as you would expect, there's been a lot of interest in our session this morning. There've been many questions um, via our event chat, um, but we are out of time. So my apologies to those that we've not been able to to take today. I think we will be back for further discussions on on this this issue and and issues you know regarding wider diversity too. But before we close, I would like to give each of our panellists one minute to sum up the key points for them raised in discussion today. So if I can start with COCAB, then move to Jatin, and then finally Foisel. Over to you, COCAB. Thanks, Alison. Um, I think for me, uh, what's been great first and foremost is to have an hour to actually get underneath um, the, the big issues and to actually have a proper discussion. More often than not, it's about sound bites, whereas I think we have explored the issues in a bit more detail. Um, I think we all recognise that uh, progress has been made, that a few barriers have been broken. Um, however, we cannot be complacent in any way whatsoever, and we need to make sure that the momentum that we have gained uh, keeps going, and that is incumbent on all of us, um, and especially the Scottish Parliament, um, as uh, you know, a beacon of good practice that is representative of a modern, uh, diverse, inclusive Scotland. Um, I think, from my point of view, um, just very quickly, <laughs> I'll tell the story. Uh, when I went back to say goodbye to the kids at school, because I was still teaching right up until uh, getting elected. And um, one uh, black girl in particular, who had never thought about the Scottish Parliament, didn't think it was for her. There was no relevance at all. And she said to me, she says, I can't believe that my teacher, who looks like me, is now an elected member in, uh, as an MSP. Do you think that I could do that job, Mrs Stewart? And I said, yes, you can do that job. And she said, but it was, took you so long to do it, because I've read your story online. Um, what makes you think it will be easier for me? And I said to her, I says, listen, I says, it will be easier for you because you have me there. <laughs> you know, I have opened that door for you and I will be there to make sure that I can represent you until you can come and represent yourself and everybody else. And we do represent Scotland. We're not just representing the ethnic minorities. We can and are fully capable of representing the constituents that we serve. Thank you, Kokab. Can I move to Jatin? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think my my takeaway from today is yeah, representation is really important. But what we've seen from some of the questions is anti-racist action is also as important, and and the two go hand in hand to a large extent. Uh, I mean, luckily in Scotland, race has not become a party political issue, so we can all work together on on things. And I suppose. If I can just abuse my position here, I, I mean, Coca is right. It's, you know, BME representatives have a range of interests and, and are not just there to look at race or equality, but there is some onus on you as to keep it on the agenda as well. So my plea would be uh, for the six of you to form a parliamentary black caucus and, and use that as a mechanism for keeping other MSPs on their toes about this issue. Thank you very much, Jetton. Um and to, to Foisel, um if you if you could give us a, a one minute summary of your, your main points from today's discussion. Thank you very much. Um I think I would like to thank uh organizers for organizing this and uh, uh, what is coming out from today is 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 very clear. Uh that but but first of all I think we all need to admit uh, that racism do uh, exist, and if we say to ourselves that it doesn't exist, we'll never be able to tackle that. Uh, to me, Black History Month is not only about this month. Black history needs to be part of the curriculum. History should be told fully. Uh, I think the message for everyone is: let's work together and create a humanity to be proud of we can all be part of making difference we cannot change the, we cannot change the past but we can amend the present and shape the future it needs to start from now thank you very much foisel um, thank you very much indeed 
think we, we must end there. I've certainly learned a lot from our panel this afternoon. I'm very grateful to you all. I know that those who have joined us will have found this a very worthwhile discussion. I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us online today for making such a great contribution to our discussion. And I'd also like to thank our partners, CRER, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and their Chief Executive, Jatin Harai, for his support. Um, thank you very much indeed, Jatin. I'd like to thank our members of the Scottish Parliament for giving up their time today to join us, Cocav Stewart and to Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you very much indeed. And can I just take this opportunity to remind all watching that the festival continues later today. We'll have panels on climate change's impact on the Scottish Islands, climate activism, and tomorrow we will discuss everything from innovation's role in tackling climate crisis in big brains to big solution and culture's role in good health and well-being. I do hope you can join us, but goodbye, everyone. Thank you for now.